Yes. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for being here. Uh, I'm Susan Sirocco. I'm the Director of Creative Economy for Arlington County, Virginia, in, our, in the Department of Economic Development. And I'm really excited about our speaker today, uh, Matt Wagner, who's come here from Chicago, where I'm hoping it's a little colder than it is here. Um, so I've had the opportunity to manage the Made in Arlington program, among other things, among other initiatives here in Arlington. And it's given me the opportunity to see what the potential is and what some of the challenges are for small businesses uh, who are looking to scale up, what are their opportunities, what are their resources, what's the capacity for building a business from start. So today's program with Matt will give us a little bit of an insight into what's been happening across the country in programs that he's been involved in that show us how resources are being leveraged to the advantage of a lot of small businesses. So please welcome Matt Wagner for our, our presentation. All right. All right. Good afternoon, everyone. How's everyone doing? All right. So Susan set me up. Um, she also asked that I just uh, say a little bit about myself um, before I uh, sort of crank into this. So um, Susan mentioned I'm Matt Wagner from the, uh, the National Main Street Center, although we just have uh, created a new sort of logo over the last couple of years. And so going back into like 20, 25 years in Main Street, I still call us the National Main Street Center. <laughs> and anyone that's part of Main Street tends to do that even though we have a new branding called Main Street America. So if I go back and forth, you'll know why, okay? It's a little bit of old school, new school uh, coming out uh, in me. My background has largely been around downtown revitalization, um, entrepreneurship, um, and a, a foray into the corporate world that I'll, I'll talk just briefly uh, about. I actually started my career out in a small town in Wisconsin called Sheboygan Falls. Um, and in 1995, uh, Main Street at the national level had created what was called the Great American Main Street Awards, and we were one of the first five in the country to win it. And my friend Doug Lozier over here probably remembers those days. And shortly thereafter, I made my way to DC uh, to work at the National Main Street Center in my first go around. Um, I later went back into the trenches, uh, back to Wisconsin in a community called uh, Racine, right on Lake Michigan. Did a lot of um, downtown revitalization work um, there. Um, and then, lo and behold, uh, maybe because I'm schizophrenic or something, I decided to go into academia. I finished my PhD uh, at the University of Wisconsin and taught in entrepreneurship, uh, a little bit in urban economic development and policy. Uh, and then, lo and behold, uh, uh, a company you may be familiar with called S.C. Johnson. S.C. Johnson, a family company. You guys know the commercials, right? Uh, you can't get that out of your head now all day long, and you will see those commercials. So they make Glade, Windex, et cetera. Uh, long story short, um, I became the director of global community affairs. I led global philanthropy. Um, so I had the, the great opportunity to give away lots of money. Uh, that was fun. Uh, I then moved into the real estate side and led um, our real estate holding companies uh, involving our retail and our um, uh, service and back office uh, functions. Um, and then in, two, in 2015, I had the great opportunity to sort of come back. You get these great opportunities in life, I think, sometimes where passion and time in life match as well. And I was able to come back to the National Main Street Center. Main Street America. Uh, so now I'm the Vice President of Revitalization Programs. Uh, and the great thing about that position is I get to be very entrepreneurial. I get to get out into communities, see what's happening across the country, um, and uh, really think forward about sort of this unique environment that we're in where place is becoming an ever more important um, sort of aspect of how we think about community and economic development from place-based assets to the role of local investment and local investing from within. And now, uh, what I'll talk about uh, this afternoon is really the role um, and the potential role, I think, of small-scale manufacturers um, as we think about how they can um, sort of reinvent the local economies within downtown districts, urban districts, uh, et cetera, across the country. So with that, I'm going to start off just talking a little bit about who, who we are, just I'll spend a few moments um, on that. So Main Street America um, was founded by the National Trust for Historic Preservation here in uh, DC. 
Um, we're now into our 40th year. Uh, so certainly not a sort of Johnny come lately uh, to the world of uh, revitalization. Um, and uh, you can see that over the years, we've been heralded as one of the top economic development programs relative to how we leverage um, public and private investment. Um, and so we have Main Street programs all across the country and just about every state um, here in the country. Um, and lots of different, um, in terms of money uh, leveraged for every dollar put into uh, Main Street programs from the public sector, um, our programs are leveraging nearly $40 in, uh, in private money. Um, we have many different programming at the national level from a, uh, from a conference. This year we'll be in Dallas. Uh, at the end of May, we've got about 2,000 people, 2,000 crazy Main Streeters. From, please feel free to join us. Doug knows. Come to the Big Bash. It's one of the best things ever. Uh, massive party. Um, and uh, so we do that. We're a big resource, sort of clearinghouse for revitalization efforts um, across the country in terms of things like small scale, um, but also just like organizational capacity, how to do resource development, how to recruit volunteers, to design, to economic development, um, how to do promotions and marketing activities uh, in your district. So if you're interested in that, feel free to go to MainStreet.org and you can learn a lot more um, about the uh, organization. We are known for what's called the four-point um, approach. And as you think about like small scale and supporting small scale, um, uh, manufacturing or production within your respective uh, communities, um, irregardless of that particular sort of sector of the economy, this kind of thought, this kind of comprehensive approach to, I think, community development and economic development works well with lots of different industry sectors. So if you think about small scale, you know, generally you need some sort of capacity to work with them, some organizational partnerships, um, some alignment there. Um, what we're seeing and what I'll talk a lot about is the significance of place, especially the built environment. So when we think about historic buildings, how many of you go to a brewery? Anyone been there lately to a microbrewery? Come on, don't be shy. You've all, come on, you've all been there, right? Like nine times out of 10, or maybe 9.9 .9 times out of 10, where are they? They're in some like, or they're like, like they're in some historic building, right? Or some old industrial warehouse building. Um, that doesn't happen like by happenstance. There's lots of thought that goes into that and there's purpose behind that. So this alignment around sort of the built environment and the, the branding and the sort of the consumer experience that goes with that is a key component within small scale production. We're gonna talk a little bit more about that. So there is a design aspect to this. And then certainly there's promotions and marketing like bringing a network and a cluster of those businesses together where we're branding. Now you're seeing like all kinds of programs like made in Baltimore, made in Cincinnati, made in Tacoma. I mean, there is a marketing angle to it, a social media, uh, a website development that goes with it. And then finally, certainly there's an economic basis uh, for this work in terms of like economic diversification, how we create jobs, how do we create meaningful work, how do we give opportunity to, to artisans and makers um, that is a, certainly a component of this as well. So we think that the, the four-point approach um, can serve as, as, in many ways, an overlay uh, to how you think and how you work with small-scale producers. Okay, so just by way of a little bit of history, okay, because many of us, well, maybe I'm old enough, I don't know, but some of you, I see some really young faces out there as well, may not remember a time in which commercial districts and especially downtowns actually had manufacturing. Like it actually was there, right? And then we, over time, you know, there were logistic challenges uh, to getting in truck transit into a downtown, narrow streets, especially like on the East Coast, but even in the Midwest. Um, there were changes in technology and logistics, global environments, to where a platform of a three-story, you know, warehouse manufacturing building along some river didn't necessarily work for modern sort of modern day high volume manufacturing processes. And so a lot of that went to obviously like greenfield sites. And so manufacturing over time changed. And so those buildings, many set vacant, and then about in the 1980s and especially heading into the 1990s with the use of like historic tax credits, affordable house tax credits, 
that a lot of these buildings started to bring back new life. But we still didn't necessarily think about manufacturing as a component um, of that. Okay? And so building stock-wise, you know, we were using these kind of facilities for lots of different other things. But I think what's now starting to take place, as I mentioned before, is now this is coming full circle uh, again. And there are huge fundamental shifts in manufacturing processes, technology, logistics, that are giving small scale an opportunity to be competitive without the capital investment that was typically necessary in large scale manufacturing. So um, we get often asked, and I'm sure those that are involved in this, like, well, what is small scale manufacturing? Um, and it is, it is somewhat difficult to define um, because it, it crosses over lots of different industry sectors. You know, you can find small scale manufacturers in apparel, to food, to a bicycle manufacturer. I mean, like every industry has essentially been touched by the ability to start out at a smaller scale from someone's garage to basement to kitchen, et cetera, and then scale up. So it's very difficult, like sort of from a traditional Nix codes perspective, to have a category of small scale. So it's really about um, the amount of capital investment, um, the equipment, the production runs at which we sort of categorize it. But having like one sort of industry definition, um, this is probably the closest that I've seen. But I tend to like think you kind of know it when you see it. <laughs> and um, it does cross over many, many uh, different sectors of the economy. Um, these are just some examples um, that we're seeing um, out there. I live in, um, well, I work in Chicago. I actually live in Milwaukee. Um, and um, in just about mm, 40 miles to the, to the west is Trek bike manufacturer. So many of you may know Trek. Well, in the city of Milwaukee, um, there's now like six tiny small scale bike manufacturers doing everything from single speed to e-bikes to fat tire bikes, all within specialization, but certainly within small batch runs. Unlike Trek, it's obviously doing manufacturing in China and other places, including Wisconsin, but obviously at a much, much larger scale. And what you're tending to find is a huge consumer shift to wanting more unique product items. And I'm going to talk about that as another sort of fueling agent um, that's going into these examples. Okay. So again, everything from food production. Food production was probably one of the, uh, the ones that really made the, I guess, the fastest sort of return, especially in the coffee uh, market, um, where we were starting to see much more in terms of like coffee roasters that were going into downtown uh, facilities. Um, and uh, whether it was falling on the heels of the whole Starbucks phenomena and recognizing that you could actually sell someone a, a cup of coffee for five or six dollars and get away with it. Uh, uh, and so, but now you see everything from, you know, even local bakeries that are now scaling and selling breads and pies to local restaurants or whatever and using wholesaling as a, as a mechanism there. But again, it does pretty much cross, um, um, you know, the gamut in terms of industry sectors. And so part of, I think, the puzzle for many of you that might be working like in a district mode or a downtown mode is to really better understand where do you have opportunities? Like where are maybe some particular niches or clusters of industry types so that when you think about the support system for those, there's actually some industry overlay that can go with that because there is specialization in some of these areas um, that might affect in the support system for them. Um, this is just, you know, pictures from around the country that you see. Everything from like in Duluth that uh, has actually quite a bit of like outdoor manufacturing specialized because of like the lake economy there. Um, and people that are in canoes to motorcycles. You have like Polaris up in that area. Um, to um, canned goods, obviously, jewelry, uh, leather, you know, on the apparel side, health and beauty aids. I mean, it just goes all around. Uh, the gamut. Um, these are just some Main Street examples um, that we see out there. Everything from in Nebraska, you know, a soap company that now has scaled, and that, that's a key. And we're going to talk a little bit about like what's the progression from a scaling uh, perspective because it's all over the place, obviously. 
but from an economic development perspective, how do we think about moving them through the sort of life cycle um, as possible? But this particular um, company, you know, is now in Whole Foods, Bed Bath and Beyond. Although we'll see what happens with Bed Bath and Beyond from a national <laughs> perspective. We know what ha what's happening nationally in terms of retailing. Um, in Leadville, there's Melizana, which is just a great outdoor recreation um, company in terms of uh, apparel. Um, and the nice thing, again, uh, from an economic perspective, is these folks are in a downtown uh, building. And so they have a retail component and then sort of back office manufacturing production. And as we think about um, experiential shopping opportunities, unique products, um, pay scale, for jobs um, in, a, in a sort of retail environment. Um, the, the economic churn of those jobs in a downtown, and now that might result in someone wanting to live in the downtown, be able to walk to work. And there's just lots of spinoff uh, ramifications of that. And so there are small town examples, and then obviously there are more sort of urban district um, examples. So you go to like a Salt Lake City, where um, we just named the, the Granary District about a year and a half ago, um, a Main Street initiative, an old warehouse uh, area right outside of downtown. And uh, the anchor point there was Frida's Bistro, that was a restaurant. But they started to get such a following um, and highly entrepreneurial, they ended up creating their own brands of, um, you know, sort of the raw materials that went into the food, everything from, from beans to, you know, pico to what have you. And now they're shipping to major regional grocery stores throughout the West. They've got 100 um, SKUs within uh, their production line, and they're employing a boatload of people right behind uh, the restaurant, okay? All right. Um, the other thing I think is starting to occur, and many of you are at the forefront um, of this, is we're seeing this as an opportunity to kind of create some district identity, um, to really look at how we cluster these, these businesses, much like you see with restaurant districts and art, arts districts or arts and entertainment districts, um, you're now seeing small scale manufacturing districts uh, begin to pop up. Um, Duluth, I think, has gotten quite a bit of um, sort of media exposure. There was a great NPR piece many, many years ago. They were sort of at the forefront um, of this. Um, and a lot of this happens organically in some cases. Um, but here in the, what they call their craft district, as you can see, um, a lot of these are kind of like complementary um, that maybe use similar skill sets of the workforce that's in that particular um, um, area, um, so or knowledge uh, base, um, or is part of the brand identity of those particular uh, communities. So outdoor recreation, you know, the whole paddling, that kind of thing, to the motorcycle stuff, leather, and then Owasso, which has been relatively new uh, to this scene and happened organically as well. You start to see some of these businesses pop up, and you're like, Eureka, there might be something here. So Owasso is about, uh, about 30 miles outside of Flint, uh, if you're familiar with the Michigan um, area. And, um, but a lot of like um, auto engineers uh, in the area, people that understand manufacturing, and, um, but they may be in a whole like different sector, out, obviously outside of the auto industry, but they take that same sort of skill set and know-how and apply it to something that they're very passionate about, which may be things from popcorn to chocolate, now they have a leather goods uh, manufacturer. You like walk in there. You can watch them like pounding things out. They're making like belts and handbags and everything else right in this storefront. And you can watch them. You can like you know learn how it's being done. The smells. I mean, it's a whole experiential basis. Yes, Doug. Are those examples are they all in one building or are they dispersed? No, they're dispersed. Yeah. Yep, they're dispersed. So, yeah, um, great question, Doug. Like, so what you tend to see is um, because of the nature, especially like in urban districts or smaller downtowns where you, you, you don't necessarily control a lot of the property, um, and so this whole clustering idea sometimes has to come through more about like marketing and brand identity and, and then like showing the linkage between these um, versus trying to cluster them all tightly uh, together. Yeah. Yeah, um, um, I don't know necessarily about Duluth, the heritage in the craft district, but certainly in Owasso, in um, you, had, you had that as, a, as an element. 
And so there are varying degrees. Obviously, there are hot market areas, and then there are those that still need some revitalization um, activity. I mean, I think small scale can work in, in both, but there may have to be some incentivizing. There may be, have to be like rental subsidy programs. There may have to be like commercial land trust. I mean, there may have to be other tools that help make this happen. I think the nice thing from a, like a high rent district, what you get with small scale, is you can still have that independent retail feel, obviously, that unique experience. But much like you find in like a pharmacy or something like that, where you have lost leaders, and then you have the, the real money makers, with the, the ability to ship, to have the value added product, to have regional markets or national markets, is where you get then enough of the income level without necessarily some of the foot traffic to make that uh, possible, okay? So I think you, you can certainly, it just may look and feel a little bit different and the kinds of programming may be slightly different, okay? Good questions, and, and feel free, like we can interrupt as we go through. I, I got no problem with that, okay? Um, I, have a, I have a quick question. Yeah, sure. Are you an economist? You didn't say what you got your PhD in. Oh, sorry. <laughs> no, I did terrible in the con. No, <laughs> no, no. My PhD is in is in urban economic development policy. Um, so, um, yeah, I wouldn't necessarily. I'm more from the the school of hard knocks when it comes to the economy, <laughs> living it, doing it, being in the trenches, seeing it. Yeah, yeah. Okay. But if we want to talk supply and demand, I don't know. <laughs> OK. Um, the other, so we're seeing some of this clustering uh, take place. Um, many people are recognizing some of the shifts in consumerism, where there is now, in somewhat, a, a divide between convenience and low price, high volume that we're seeing, which is largely a lot of where your um, internet shopping is taking place outside of like just you know perishable goods and services like perhaps grocery or pharmacy that kind of thing but even that while well, that's on the, um, the online and then this whole sort of um, unique experiential built environment specific community engagement specific retailing uh, that's happening out there and that's kind of where this obviously um, is is falling and so there are now major initiatives primarily in like the marketing branding uh, not necessarily always in like the support systems that you would define by what we would call an ecosystem. Uh, we'll talk a little bit, a little bit about uh, that. But things like the Made in Baltimore uh, program. So you can go Google Made in Baltimore. You'll see a website. It's a member-based organization um, that really does things more in terms of like branding, marketing. There's a certification uh, program um, as part of it. Um, it includes retailers, makers, but also the actual sort of maker spaces um, as well. And then they do some networking and mentoring, okay? So you're seeing more of this kind of stuff uh, pop up um, as well. Some other initiatives, um, and they're at various stages um, um, of development. And if you, also if you want, like from a resource perspective, there's some really nice emerging you know, um, um, resources out there. If you're familiar with like Smart Growth America, um, a few years back, uh, they received some funding from the US Economic Development Administration, and we're doing some pilot initiatives in small scale uh, production, especially in urban districts. So check out Smart Growth America and what they did. They produced a publication um, around that. There's, there's groups like Recast City that they're highly specialized uh, in this particular niche around small scale production. So there's just some really good emerging resources out there. I mean, like we're one, but there's many um, um, out there as well that I sort of tip a hat to as, as well. Um, so Pittsburgh's been working on some of their neighborhood revitalization and recognizing like how do you convert some of their warehousing space to more maker space operations. Tacoma, Washington, sort of their made in Tacoma, just like made in Baltimore. You're seeing the made in stuff all over the place. We're seeing it state level. So if you go to like Wyoming, you're going to see a made in Wyoming uh, program out there. Um, the other big uh, interesting part of this is the whole workforce development angle um, to this. Um, what's, what's been 
I think it's somewhat prob problematic that we found in sort of interviews with small scale manufacturers. It's not always the demand for the product that's been part of the barrier or the challenges from a scaling. It's finding the talent, finding the workforce that may understand like how to operate a high speed sewing. <laughs> you know, piece of equipment <laughs> or, you know, uh, baking or something along those lines. And unfortunately, the traditional sort of workforce development agencies that are out there um, aren't typically attuned to that. And then it's so highly specialized that even though like at the technical college or the community college, you may not have a program like you'd find like with welders or CNC operators. And so I think that talent equation is also um, needs to be part of the support system because you can have great ideas and you can have people wanting your product, but if you have no way to make it, that's a problem, right? Um, okay, so some common th threads that, um, that we're seeing from small scale uh, producers. Um, one, they're using local to their advantage. So um, where they're at is a distinct part of how they market themselves and how they think of themselves. Because again, consumers, if you're traveling, if you're, if you're going to visit, you don't want to buy the same darn thing that you could buy anywhere else in a local Walmart, right? Or anywhere, or online, um, you know? You, you want to buy something that's unique to that particular place that can tell a story about that particular place or about the particular uh, business itself. And so local is definitely a competitive advantage against mass producers uh, that are out there. You ever, maybe I'm, I'm like giving you my insight in terms of my like for beer, but you ever go into a microbrewery, like you always ask, or even a local bar, you will ask, you will tend to ask now, like, well, what's your local beer? Like, you know, I wanna try, I wanna try that, right? And so local is, is a big part of this. Most have like a retail customer interface. And certainly from my standpoint, working in downtowns and urban districts, that's what I'm looking for. I'm looking for another sort of supplement to how people might come to that particular area, another reason for them to come that supplements retail, um, that can create foot traffic, that can serve as an anchor, and that can work with sort of service, government, and other sort of civic um, opportunities that you might find in that district. It's another element uh, to bring to the table. There's certainly a quality angle to it. They tend to be a little bit more on the value add um, side highly specialized, there's certainly a uniqueness and an experiential, which we know in terms of like looking at consumer studies is something very important uh, from a bricks and mortar perspective is to be able to have some sort of experience, to be educated about the product, to be able to tell a story, to, to visualize, watch, maybe even participate. Um, so I was in um, South Boston, Virginia on, God, what day was it this week? Wednesday, today's Friday. On Wednesday, I was in South Boston. And um, I was in um, this flower, um, a flower shop. It was brand new. They had opened up like, I think like eight weeks um, ago. And while not exactly an example from a small scale pr uh, production, certainly an experiential one, where they had what was called the flower bar. And so you walked in and this great neon sign and it was like build a bear but you were building your own floral arrangement. So like I could become like a professional florist, right? And, uh, and so you think about like something very unique versus going to like TDF or 1-800-Flowers or whatever it's called out there, the ability to participate and then like give a gift or tell a story about a particular product can occur in lots of different industry types. But that experiential is the value added part that's gonna get someone in to like a small scale uh, business. Um, we're also seeing some more movement in terms of like environmentally friendly or social consciousness is part of the production. You see that with like fair trade uh, kinds of things or organics, that, that kind of thing. And then obviously it's something, there's a big what we call like psychographic angle here, something that speaks to your lifestyle, something that says something about who you perceive yourself as a person, uh, what your interests are, what your hobbies might be, um, and if that speaks to you, um, that's giving you a unique shopping opportunity that no one else uh, can replicate. So 
let's talk a little bit about, spend a little bit of time on sort of what's driving. Because um, there are some micro conditions, but obviously there is a macro environment that is impacting and giving the ability for these small scale producers to really exist, okay? So one is certainly technology. So when we think about um, entrepreneurship, oh wait, slight little just quick deviation. If anyone wants these slides, feel free. I don't know if there's a record, like I'll post it, I'll send a PDF, you can, like you all can have this, no, no big deal, okay? So if you're writing or whatever, or taking, feel free to do that, but you can have this, okay? So one of the biggest impediments historically to manufacturing from an entrepreneurship perspective is that manufacturing has always been the most capital intensive industry to get into. So most of the time you get into an entrepreneurial venture because it's a passion, maybe you were educated in it, you worked in it, you had a family member that was in it, um, something along those lines. And so if it's manufacturing and you were like back in the 1980s, that was a huge capital investment because you had to be at scale. There were very little low scale opportunities or short run opportunities, okay? It was all about scale and volume. And that took big buildings, it took heavy equipment, very expensive equipment from robotics to CNC to whatever. I mean, these aren't little minor purchases. And if you think about now how everything from a technology perspective has come down in scale and come down in price. Remember, anyone remember when 3D printers came out? What was that, maybe like 10 years ago, something like that? And now like you can like maybe carry one in your pocket practically. I mean, like it's that insane. Um, and, 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 you know, so everything from, you know, high speed kitchen, you know, like um, uh, mixers and that thing to sewing equipment. Um, to what have you, the price and the scale have all really come down and made this more possible. Um, even to do like sort of like R&D and prototypes, that's all come down, okay? The other big shift has been how do you get into the market? Like when there was no internet, when there was no like big scale of FedEx and UPS or DHL or whatever it is, like ways to ship, um, like that all has come down in price. And like there's people obviously working in their basement doing like packaging and everything else. And the FedEx person shows up in the morning and by the next day it's to the consumer, okay? And so that's also enabled. And then the whole marketing aspect of online. So you think about like a group like Etsy, I'm sure with this group, like everyone knows Etsy, right? So like in 2014, they, they were roughly doing about, about 500 million in sales. Four years l later, they're like four or five billion dollars in sale. But what most people don't realize about the online platform is like 60% of Etsy vendors are bricks and mortar stores. And so again, the ability to leverage platforms and reach large national, international audiences, like it's cheap, okay? So it's really taken the capital side of manufacturing to one that's much more attainable for most people without you know, carrying around a few million bucks in your pocket, okay? Um, some other things that, it, that have um, um, changed and shifted in some areas, just pure rental rates, the ability to get into a downtown building pretty inexpensively, the footprints are nice, you know, they're all like, you know, 2,000, 2,200 square feet or so. You can do production very easily there. A lot of them had alleys you can pull up or they allow shipments in front. They got retail exposure so you could build brand pretty cheaply, but also then obviously shift um, out. Building functionality work well. Um, I think there's more of a push and an enlightenment um, around the need for the revitalization of downtowns and urban districts. There's people moving into those places that want kind of a cool shopping environment and small scale lends itself very well uh, to that. Um, I'm gonna talk a little bit more in, in just a little bit about like pipelines that are being developed. And I don't mean like oil and gas industry pipelines. It's like all the, like, the programming 
like farmer's markets. That's probably the top example, right? Like who doesn't have a farmer's market now? But if you think of that as pipeline development or early stage R&D for value added production that then can scale, that's what I mean in terms of like pipeline. And there are lots of different examples of that kind of thing for different industry types that you can look into. Certainly I've, I've probably hammered enough on like the nature of retailing consumer uh, preferences. Um, and then the whole place uh, side, okay, the, the local uh, characteristics of it. But certainly probably the top has been the technology and access to markets, without a doubt. All right, so on the consumer shift uh, uh, side of things, I meant if you are a, a low volume, you know, niche producer, um, without a doubt, you're going to be at a higher price point. Okay, and so the, 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 the marketing edge uh, to that is that, one, it's more unique, there may be a quality angle to it, you can tell a story about it versus some sort of mass production made in China, Malaysia, wherever um, it's, it's particularly made. And what statistics are showing is that people will definitely spend more money on that, and all you have to do is use the Starbucks example, it's a perfect one, okay, it's just coffee, folks and yet we spend all this money um, on it. Um, but there's an experience there in some cases. Um, there's typically repeat um, shopping that will take place as well. Um, and um, the Amex, American Express, that does you know, Shop Small, Small Business Saturday, um, is part of their last, this last year, um, is part of their survey that they do, they do with the National Federation of Independent uh, business, uh, Businesses. 96% um, agree that shopping at small, independently owned businesses that make a social, economic, or environmental impact, which obviously is small scale, many of those operations fall into, is part of the very reason why that they want to be there, they want to support these kinds of uh, business operations. So certainly from a consumer perspective, we're becoming more leisure oriented and more experiential uh, when we're going out to sort of bricks and mortar um, opportunities. Um, also, we're seeing like this whole architectural in place mattering more and more. So Cushman Wakefield, um, they do an annual study. This is actually, if you want to see this, this was part of um, a Smart Growth America um, report that came out. But in this particular study, uh, many of those corporate leaders, and we think about like how office users and big business looks at locations. And the big shift there has really been beyond like the traditional of like what's the, what's the land cost, what are the utility rates, water rates, all yada, 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 to be more about the place environment. And that goes for small scale um, as well. Um, so they're looking definitely for more of these locations that kind of speak to the identity they're trying to create as well as the workforce they're trying to attract, as well as the shoppers from a retail perspective um, that actually want to be there. And so you can check out that, um, uh, that study uh, there. All right, I want to give a couple of statistics, um, um, both um, actually nationally, um, but also in Virginia, which will be the next, uh, the next slide. So um, we were interested in understanding um, from a manufacturing perspective what was happening because qualitatively, like anecdotally, as we went around the country, it was like, oh, that's a small scale producer. Oh, that's what, and like every community we were going to, we were seeing more of this kind of stuff pop. And so we have now about a thousand downtown and urban district GIS shape files. And so we've been able to start pulling data uh, from them and comparison and doing comparisons between their locales. So this isn't like trying to compare downtown in Wyoming to one in Virginia and vice versa. This is actually looking at their local economy versus their district economy, okay, and seeing some differences. And long and short, short of it is year over year, and if you're interested in like the latest um, statistics as well, can, and can pull those. But in both in terms of like manufacturing growth rates, sales um, and job growth, we're seeing higher performance of manufacturing Nixco-based businesses in downtowns and urban districts than the rest of the areas, okay? Now, I will say a lot of that has to do with scale. So if you look at like any small business administration, 
you know, data, you will see that most job growth occurs from like phase one to phase two of like, of like a business life cycle. And as you get more mature, you tend to get more efficient. You maybe bring in like, you know, higher, higher productivity through robotics or what have you. And so, yeah, you might not see some of that jobs um, or as fast paced growth. But it is interesting to think about from a life cycle and from a real estate cycle that downtowns and your urban districts, your communities can play a much stronger presence in how we scale from the basement and garage to maybe that industrial site at one time. But we've been missing the middle component. Most people don't go from their garage or their kitchen to a 40,000 square foot industrial site. And so, Purely from a support system and a, uh, a real estate place system, that's been missing. And I think you know many of you that that are that are serving in those roles and looking at this play a significant you know role in helping to build that support system on many levels to make that leap happen. Otherwise, I, I think we're hard pressed to make that occur. So I think we have a distinct role in doing that in sort of Main Street like community and economic development like. Um, um, areas and partnerships. In, Ma in Virginia, same thing, okay? So this is from 17 to 18. We'll pull 19 um, here shortly. But again, same thing um, overall, very consistent. Um, we were just doing some work in Wyoming, did the same report, same thing, um, <laughs> over and over again. So whether it's national, state, what have you, but certainly in Virginia, looking at Virginia Main Street communities, um, and looking at the rest of their citywide um, efforts, um, same deal, okay? All right, some of the benefits, you know, if you're still like thinking about this from a pure sort of economic development perspective and where you're gonna put resources and time and energy when there's no shortage of things that you might need to work on, right? Um, uh, in terms of your own work program. Certainly there is an equitable economic development angle uh, to that as we think about diversity within workforce. Um, data shows that small scale manufacturing entrepreneurs come from lots of different backgrounds. Again, if we can carve down the barriers to entry, that gives more people an opportunity to participate um, in this particular, and there's certainly no shortage of skill, skill set and passion uh, within, within all of our groups. Etsy um, has provided this platform. The interesting thing is the growth of women entrepreneurs in small scale. Um, again, I like just um, anecdotally can't like reach in the back of my pocket on the data front um, on this, but like visually, most of the entrepreneurs we're seeing in downtown districts and in urban business districts are women. Okay, cut across the ethnic and racial uh, lines is just a massive, uh, from a gender perspective, uh, many more women uh, in this particular area, okay? Um, and then diversifying the economy and uses of buildings, which I think is really important, is traditional retailing becomes increasingly hyper-competitive. Um, certainly there's a recognition that we were overbuilt from a real estate uh, perspective. Um, Doug and I have a, a, a mutual acquaintance in Kennedy Smith, and I know they've done studies, and I, I'll like always misquote her, Doug, but it's like four times overbuilt, maybe it's even five times overbuilt versus what we actually have the capacity to spend on retail in terms of the real estate built environment. Um, this past year alone, there were close to like 10,000 retailing business closures with national chains, and 2019 was the biggest year ever for that from a national um, chain and franchise perspective, and we're going to see more in 2020. It's just going to uh, continue um, as online eats into that particular retail sector, especially if you think about like the apparel, the shoes, that kind of thing. Um, has just been a big domino. So if you're dealing with a, a, a district or a downtown and you're recognizing that, boy, there's a, <laughs> there's a lot of competition in the retail front, small scale that has a retail component but can also be supported by more of a national or regional or international sales um, component to it and has a unique product, um, that's competitive advantage, uh, especially from a bricks and mortar perspective and can help diversify that. It can also bring uh, just uh, like new markets, new consumer markets. So maybe you're very localized or hyper-local 
environment, potential to bring in other foot traffic and other users uh, that might be attracted to those particular retail uses is another way to just increase sort of the density of shoppers. Yes. Our commercial environment yes. right now, retail environment. So um, I do know where we don't have enough affordable housing, and I think in one case, not too far from here, a mall has been converted to um, actually a homeless shelter, okay. or at least supporting that some of those functions. So my question is, who's doing the thinking about the conversions that could happen, um, and what it takes to make those conversions happen if we have too much built? for commercial and not enough for residential. Is there anybody doing thinking about this or research? Yeah, um, I, I mean, ULI's done some work in this area. I mean, if you look at like their annual report on real estate uh, trends, you know, and they've done some case studies, I think, on this part. I think the problem is that there's, there's generally not, like, you know, for downtowns and urban districts, you have like associations and groups that are really hyper-focused, whether it's, International Downtown Association to Main Street. Um, and so, you know, there's, there's looking at that. But when it comes to like former malls or even like, you know, 1960, 1970 auto related kinds of strip centers, there really isn't ha like a lot of focus because traditionally they may be in suburban markets where the focus is more on like single family housing or maybe industrial development. So I think to your point, I, I'm sure there is. I'm just not aware of like someone that's really looking in to, to that. Um, you know, what I do do see more often is um, maybe still attempt to do something on that parcel. There's lots of like, let's just demo. It's like throw away real estate. Let's demo and let's try to do something that can mimic the qualities of place where consumer. If it's looking at a retail uh, component. Um, live work, there's a lot of like, um, they're putting in government facilities like, like uh, workforce development training sites or community colleges are going in. Um, so I meant it seems to be a mixed bag, but I don't, I, I'm not aware of like a group, a national organization that's spending a little, like a hyper focus on that. Okay, okay. All right, some of the other benefits we're seeing, Brookings uh, came out uh, with a study just talks about like pay scale, which I mentioned um, earlier, where we get jobs from. Again, if you're talking about like new creation of jobs, um, I hate like the metric of jobs uh, just from a personal economic development because it says nothing about the quality of the jobs. And I think with small scale, you have real potential to make an impact on like what wage scales are, are like. Um, the teaching of certain skill sets, um, the, you know, the ability to grow with a, with a firm as it scales um, up. I just think there's a lot of great um, opportunities there. Um, and as well as um, sort of the diversity um, that we see in smaller scale uh, manufacturers. It also helps these companies to diversify revenue streams. Um, so, you know, if maybe the local sort of retail market isn't as vibrant at the start, you still maybe have like B2B wholesaling opportunities or these online platforms or being part of consortiums um, that are out there or just building up your own brand identity through, you know, web development or, or something along um, those lines. Um, so that can help versus just purely traditional uh, retail um, that might uh, be totally dependent upon certain foot traffic. Some of the challenges and, and barriers really have to do with the lack, I think, of like an ecosystem. So if you think about ecosystem, not like, although I think we've got like some university or college folks in the, in the room, I don't want to get too academic, but like when we say like ecosystems, you know, it's really about like how do we as, um, as sort of role players support partners in, um, in industry sectors, whether it's tech-based, bio, or whatever, where the traditional ecosystems have largely been, that's kind of lacked in the small scale. Now, I think it's emerging. You're seeing like libraries that are getting involved in building out maker spaces or just organizations that are, that are doing that. Obviously, cities and that kind of thing, they're trying to focus maybe from a place-based perspective um, or developing programs that are branding and helping to market in this particular area. Um, but I think in terms of a complete ecosystem, um, especially in things like um, the social capital side, how we you know, can support them through networking or peer-to-peer -peer networks. 
that you get in other sort of really hotbed technology-ish uh, kind of sectors, that doesn't largely exist uh, within this particular. That might have to do with the diversity of industry types, but there's still sharing that can go on because of the scale. So whether, whether or not you're in a different industry, if you're at a similar scale, you might be having some of the similar issues or challenges or solutions, uh, frankly, uh, behind that. Um, I think places at the, uh, what I would call like the nascent level of small scale, um, we're getting better at, um, but programming from pop-ups to farmer's markets or, or whatever, more of the pipelines, uh, the exposure, the ability to scale and not go from that, you know, your garage to that 40,000 square foot industrial building is still, I think, a, a missing element out there. Yes, sir. Yeah, I'm talking about barriers. Yeah. Yeah, there we go. Thank you. Um, I, I visited a, a few years ago with one of the Widmer brothers who started the microbrewing out in, in Oregon before that really became a big deal. And his first big barrier was, of course, the state law prohibited it. Okay, yeah. You couldn't brew and sell beer on the same premises. Yeah. It took him nine years to get that law changed before he could start doing it. What kind of, um, I would say, regulatory governmental oh, yeah. barriers? What about zoning? Yeah. I mean, you can't do things in a lot of places where maybe you want to have a live work environment. Yeah, what, it's, it's, what, a great, it's, it's a great question. I mean, certainly one that tends to, like, I see, like, out in communities that comes up most often is the zoning um, because you know, because of what manufacturing was traditionally, um, a lot of those uses we like zoned out of a commercial B1 or whatever it is. Um, and now to try to bring that back up, but with a framework that works to the scale of the buildings, to what some may perceive as nuisance from like um, smells to, uh, you know, not having ta toxic odors or, you know, that kind of thing, the scale of the production overall, to shipping, to so receiving and like having raw materials dropped off. Um, I think those considerations, you know, they're, they're um, and I wish we were like a de depository of that, maybe APA is or something along those lines, but I think that is a common question, like who's starting to write, um, you know, um, good zoning around this particular sector, I think, is a is a key one. But that's you're right on spot. Like that's a huge, uh, huge barrier in some cases. Yeah, Doug. Thanks. Um, that's a great example. We moved our business out of Arlington once we discovered <laughs> that we weren't allowed to be here. We operated for a few years. And, and, and what kind of business see. was it? We we make food products. Okay. Yeah. Yep. And it's it's completely. We, don't, we didn't have any impacts on the neighbors. That's not why we left. Yeah. So we, we left 1,600 square feet, and we're at 8,000 square feet in Ivy City in D.C. now. So it was a big move, and we would have preferred to stay here for yeah. a number of reasons. We all live in the area. Um, and now as we contemplate our next move, we're looking at PG County in Maryland, which ironically has the same law in the books, which is probably designed for people who were doing what we were doing years ago at a yeah. much larger open-air type scale. Yeah. Um, and we're really trying to figure out how to navigate that and use our resources effectively and not get sucked into kind of a zoning battle, Quandary, environmental study right? thing that we really don't know how to, you yeah. know, that's not our expertise. Yeah. Very good. Doug, did you have a comment back to this gentleman or to that point? Uh, I just wanted to mention that the, the, the regulatory th piece is really substantial and in Fairfax County, we just went through that in the last uh, year or so with having to really amend the comprehensive plan and then the zoning ordinance mm -hmm. to even allow this type of small scale production use because it just, it didn't exist. It wasn't <clears throat> really reflected anywhere. It's not traditional manufacturing and it's not other things. So mm -hmm. we had to create several kind of somewhat artificial delineations like square footage or impacts uh, on the community. But that allowed us to then be able to have these types of businesses in commercial areas or other areas where they wouldn't have been normally. Yeah, yeah, very good. So you guys, you guys have gone through that. Someone could look at your new zoning as a, as a maybe example. I know like um, Lexington, Virginia, I think about a year or 18 months ago, went through that same process and wrote up some new zoning as well as another example.
out people who either had been there or who might want to come in? Because I'm kind of wondering if you're the first person in fighting the fight and you get the rules changed, you get in at that you know, good deal, and then I'm wondering if then it makes it cost prohibitive for other others, you know, like that gentrification phenomenon. I'm, I'm just curious. I haven't seen, um, but I think it's still early. Like, I haven't seen enough examples to where um, definitively say that, okay, you make these changes and then there's escalation from a real estate perspective, specifically because of the zoning um, um, shift. I mean, so many places, I mean, like for, for us, a lot of that is like rural communities and that kind of thing. So some of the complexities um, maybe in a more urban environment that you're dealing with and some of the market demand from a real estate perspective. I mean, I think there, um, there's some differences, certainly, um, there. And we, prob we probably need more examples of that. Um, but because there's been so much market demand, I don't think you see enough of the sort of from a case study perspective. Yeah. Okay, other points? Okay. Um, just some other things uh, in terms of like challenges, uh, barriers, and again, I think this is around a framework of like support system. But you know, if you're trying to scale, there can also be like equipment uh, needs, uh, especially for like pilot testing, that sort of thing. Now again, maker spaces have maybe um, um, helped out in some of that, but for other areas, it's like how do we like leverage existing resources? I mean, I think that's the thing. I mean, as we look at like um, technical colleges or community colleges that might have like fab labs or something along those lines that can be helpful, are there ways um, to leverage that? Or frankly, if there are larger scale manufacturers in that same industry type or at least equipment type, um, it's almost like you see like with night kitchens where someone's operating their kitchen in the day and like they're allowing people to like sort of Airbnb it in the evening, like can you do that in manufacturing as well um, to help these businesses from a scaling uh, perspective? Um, also, like this whole fail fast um, mentality, uh, not that I hope anyone fails, but if you're gonna fail, like fail quickly or make adjustments, course corrections, so the more opportunity we can do, like through pop-ups or in-store pop-ups or anything along those lines to help people to like test products, get it out in the market, sort of dabble their foot, get outside of the house um, type of thing, and then course correct without having to like mortgage the house or drop their 401ks on this um, because they're probably not going to get traditional bank financing. I mean, there's a gulf there, right? So if we can do like R&D fail, fa fail fast, um, that's probably uh, another part of the support system where we need to sort of elongate that out. Um, I think, you know, in terms of how we think about incentives, you know, again, a lot of the incentive base is around sort of a, a key number of jobs versus quality of jobs, about the, um, the impact on place um, and how we think about the future scaling um, opportunities, how we think about the, an investment from someone coming from outside versus someone that lives right in our back, backyard. Um, like all these kinds of things come into uh, to play, but also just like simple ones. like. Can you do like rental subsidies or some other like you know building improvement that helps them to get their you know manufacturing operation um, in, into the building? I mean, I think it's just how we think about how we fund these and how we incentivize um, them. So I wanted to spend a little bit of time talking about um, this small scale production pipeline. Um, you can call it what you want. I mean, basically, it's just how do you get people from that nascent phase? to maybe like um, you know, a retailing component and then eventually more of a large scale if that's the, that's the overall object objective. And that's all around that whole fail fast, um, helping to get more ideas in, into the pipeline. So we're seeing more deals in essence, okay? We're allowing people to kind of come out uh, from their homes, their side hustles, their what have you, um, or their online environment into a bricks and mortar situ situation. Um, so some of that is just by like leveraging more the, that whole pop-up phenomena, but like from in-store to you know Christmas markets to any kind of you know venue that you can do where they can test products out. Consumers are looking for that. 
So the opportunity, especially in like an existing store where they can carve out maybe 100 square feet or so for a small scale producer. Now, you wouldn't have the sort of experiential part of like watching them do it perhaps, depending on the scale, but it's another sort of um, inventory add to that retail operation that can be very complementary to the existing store and then give them a foothold within the market um, to then maybe scale into their own. And we're seeing lots of this kind of stuff. This is happening even irregardless of whether it's a small scale producer, this sort of complementary mixing of retail categories to give an experience uh, within a retail environment. So things like bike stores and coffee roasters, you're gonna see like some of my preferences, like I like bikes, I like breweries. So if you can put them together, like you'll have me there for sure. Um, this is actually in Matthews, North Carolina, right outside of Charlotte. So um, they're doing their brewery production and then they sell bikes. People that ride bikes, hopefully after they've gone on their bike ride, want some beer, and then you go to the coffee beforehand, okay? Um, seeing this with like line extensions. Um, I, again, I like bikes, motorcycles, that kind of thing. So in Milwaukee where I live is the home of uh, Royal Enfeld Motorcycles um, out of what used to be a British uh, um, a motorcycle manufacturer out of uh, India, and you walk into their, their store, and, and frankly, um, there's like five bikes, and the rest is all like vintage, like telling a story, how you feel, like the lifestyle, if you had that particular motorcycle versus the product itself. Um, but you can do that in a small scale kind of environment as well. So any kind of product that you're manufacturing, there might be sort of insulary storytelling items that can also uh, go with it, sort of packaging. You can also, like it's not always just someone that's starting brand new. Someone can scale, scale maybe they never even thought about um, scaling. Like they are making something on a local level, um, but haven't really thought about like distribution, you know, um, going online, selling wholesaling or whatever. And so a good example is Wooden Crate Popcorn. They're out of um, Owasso. And, and now um, approximately 70% of their retail sales in their store in downtown Owasso are out the back door, okay? And so it's really made a difference in their performance. And they're still in their retail store. Like, they still have a retail presence, a bricks and mortar presence. People can still go in there, but they're able to churn a lot more. And they're doing a lot more in sort of the B2B as a supplier to like movie theaters and that kind of thing. Um, you can help your existing businesses think about maybe scaling into online platforms so they can test the water there into you know, national or international um, distribution, or have they even thought about like what they're doing? Maybe they're a restaurant that is really well known for their pies or something like that. Are there opportunities to take certain inventory segments of what they do and what they do well and scale that portion up? Sort of a la like the Frida's restaurant in Salt Lake City that really um, saw that kind of opportunity. Um, the, probably the first foray, farmer's markets, you're all well aware of that as a, as, a, as a tool or a mechanism to do more value-added production, whether it's in jams and jellies, to pickles, or whatever it is. Now, sometimes it's not enough to support a whole store, and that's where you can start to think about like consolidation of a number of different vendors into one venue. So it doesn't always have to be like one producer, one store, but I mean, there's lots of different ways that you can combine, market, create clusters um, around these kinds of producers at various times of their uh, sort of scaling life cycle. You can tap into online uh, platforms. Has anyone gone on to Etsy and done like a search of who your Etsy people are in your area? I mean, it's a great way to kind of like discover those hidden folks because again, while 60% of their vendors tend to be bricks and mortar, there's still a boatload that are operating out and might be you know, potential with a support system, with some encouragement if they desire to, um, as future um, you know, um, retail um, bricks and mortar stores um, as well. So if you go on, if you haven't done that, if you go on to Etsy, you actually have to choose a category, but then once you choose the category, you can like search by via zip code, and then that will give you who's in uh, your area. There's certainly mobile retailing, both for just traditional retailing, but also people that might be making 
uh, products and still aren't able quite yet to go in traditional bricks and mortar. They're still maybe doing some production you know, out of their home and then featuring it um, in their uh, mobile trucks to try to build brand and market identity. But these are all just like lower cost ways to go from home to bricks and mortar and start to get um, a feel for the marketplace. And then certainly there are other more sort of real estate based pipelines that are dedicated to small scale producers, everything from you know, shared kitchen facilities uh, to maker spaces um, to drop in spaces, artist co-ops, accelerators, they all have various names associated with it. But essentially you know, they provide a space to do the work, provide equipment, maybe support services, um, maybe there's an SBDC that also is providing some technical assistance. Um, and so in some cases, they become sort of mini or micro support systems. Um, but it's like, how do, they, how do we then get them from that spot into these other, um, in terms of the life cycle? Just some additional pipelines is like mining, you know, either entrepreneurship programs or frankly, like community and technical colleges where they're doing maybe specific, like maybe there's some engineering or, or that kind of thing. Um, fashion design, Lansing, has, uh, if you've been to Lansing, Michigan, go downtown, there's a great fashion incubator um, that's then spinning off, you know, sort of small scale producers in the apparel um, side. You might have an SBDC and like, who's, who's your clients? You know, if they're interested in small scale, can you send them my way? Maybe I can help them out with space or what have you doing like pitch-it contest or shark, -like, shark tank-like contest where you're giving extra points for maybe small-scale producers. If that's a target market for you, you sort of incentivize or you give a special award for that is another way for them to kind of come out of the woodwork and think about scaling. All right, there's also um, sort of a typology of where they're at within their life cycle. So depending upon um, your interest and your program's interest, it might be at one form of this. Maybe you're on the industrial development side, um, but you know, typically you see like that artist, crafter, maker, or an ag producer. These are largely what we think of as the pipeline that we refer to. So like that fail fast stage. Maybe they have a full-time job. They're doing this as a side hustle. You know, they're part of that, the, like a cottage legislation and doing it out of their, their home. But these tend to be much more micro space um, oriented. Um, you might consider putting them into a store to test the, the marketplace. Um, they may be using like an online platform like, you know, Makers Row or Etsy. And generally may have like zero employees. I guess I should put a zero there unless they count themselves. Um, <laughs> but certainly at that smaller um, scale for sure. Okay, and then and then you know you you transition to more of a you know small producer. That's more of your traditional storefront has a retail component and a production component um, to it. Now that's not to say some of you may not be interested in the retail. I'm biased because I'm looking at like downtown revitalization and retail being a core component of that. But there are certainly like old warehouse districts where maybe the retailing isn't as big of a component. You're just looking for other spaces where you can help businesses um, scale. Um, and then, you know, where you're moving up to much more scalable producers where they sort of move beyond. A lot of them may keep, like Melizana uh, is probably at that stage, but they keep and maintain a retail component for brand identity. Even your, like your microbreweries in some cases that are really starting to scale big and now have moved production somewhere else um, may keep obviously that retail um, component as a brand marker for them. And then other ways to just support. Um, and this is why, so we've done, we start to do more interviews of small scale producers to understand like how do, how do their needs differ from like traditional retail or office sector or whatever. And, and what you find is like they know their products, but they may not understand anything around like retailing and merchandising, how to, how to do like a storefront, like design a window display. Like that may be a foreign concept to many, many of them. Um, oftentimes as they're scaling, they may not understand as much around like logistics and how to do like bulk shipping, you know, that kind of stuff to specialized workforce, which I mentioned um, earlier. 
um, you know, how to get into other markets, you know? You know, we weren't born to like think about like import export bank, you know, <laughs> like do deals um, along those lines. Um, I'm finding it may not be in like higher dense areas like where we're at today, but you go places like out west, like you may not find like someone that can do canning or bottling or like can do filling. Like you may have to go to a whole nother state. Um, so I met with this, they, he's called the salsa guy. That's really his name. Even though we all know a salsa guy, this guy really is. His product is called the salsa guy. And he couldn't, he's in Wyoming and Rock Springs, which no one probably knows about, like, but it's Rock Springs on the far western side. And literally he has to go near the Denver area because he's scaling so fast, he has no one to produce uh, the product for him. So that whole third party um, stuff is really important. Whole thing around branding and marketing. Um, also space planning. You know, when you're dealing with, um, you know, a typical like downtown building and you're trying, you're also sort of growing, like how do you lay out a manufacturing process? You know, there's a lot of engineering and design for efficiency and flow. So you're not like tripping over yourself and you, like where are you putting in product? And like, like there's, a, there's a science to that. And oftentimes at that kind of scale, that might not be a prevalent sort of service. Like if you think about like your manufacturing extension partnership groups and that kind of thing, that, you know, they may have it, but they may not. And so, but certainly many of them are looking at like space planning and laying out. And then just that whole online social media that I think like so many small businesses are trying to figure out and get uh, more acquainted with. Certainly in the small scale, they're facing that as well. I'm not gonna go through all of these. You'll be able to, to see them, but I think there's, a, there's also like more things we can do with just finding, connecting them, building that social capital side of it, the mentoring, the network. Um, what we've seen, and this is again, this is actually in Laramie, um, Wyoming, where your larger manufacture, manufacturers are starting to um, be mentors to small scale, you know, helping them to figure out where those ch the challenges and barriers, what they went through, um, or using part of their facility um, and equipment is sort of like that night market kind of concept or night kitchen kind of concept. Um, so doing that kind of stuff uh, can be really important um, as well. Identifying funding sources. Again, if, you, if you've been primarily like maybe at the downtown district level or whatever, and there's just like, there's a whole host of these, okay? Um, but certainly like from a support system and a real estate function, like so if you're thinking about incubation, you know, USDA does some of that thing, depending on the size of your community. EDA has gotten involved, and they certainly fund a lot of like incubators and stuff. Is it easy money to get? No, of course not. Um, but you know, there is that. There's leveraging of TIF or Pilot. Like, there's just a whole host of from microfinancers, and now we have opportunity zones. If anyone has those figured out, let me know. No, I'm sorry. Quick commercial. Um, crowdfunding platforms, um, and there's just. Lots of things, but it's really about figuring out, you know, who's the cluster, who are you trying to work with, what are you trying to accomplish, and then matching the best tools um, um, to position uh, with them. There's certainly things that we can do on just supporting the overall place and real estate um, strategy, because frankly, like from our perspective, this is a, a very unique, um, new, I think, new emerging opportunity for districts and um, downtown, certainly. But um, it has to be part of an overall comprehensive approach. We're not in a bubble. That brewery's not in a bubble. It's there because, yes, it may like the character of the building, but it also is part of like sort of the community engagement, like the other things that are happening in that downtown or the district that gives it momentum and a sense of place um, that really make a difference. So don't lose sight of, of that component as you look to support these particular businesses, um, especially from a real estate strategy perspective. And this is where I, we talk a lot about like that zoning and, and, and how they inter, interface there. Um, you can look at cross-section uh, partnerships. And I think this is really, since there aren't traditionally like we're the small-scale organization, although I think those things are starting to, uh, to emerge. 
You know, if you're thinking about a complete ecosystem, it really takes lots of different groups and organizations to buy in. So this whole thing around the alignment of a vision for what you're trying to do first and foremost, and alignment of mission that you're gonna support them. You're gonna put resources there. You're gonna put capacity. It all sort of levels and in, in, in around that ecosystem, I think is a really critical element um, here. We do it with for like sort of big time economic development, larger um, you know, scale projects and that kind of thing, but at the smaller scale, that might not always exist. So there's an education about why it's important, what it can do, what it is, um, that has to really go with that. And this really gets to the overall ecosystem. And so this is, this is sort of a traditional uh, graphic. Um, you see this if you go to like the, the, you know, do a search on entrepreneurial ecosystems. What you'll see is like sort of university academic um, ar around this. We've added physical environment or sense of place to this. You won't see this in um, uh, like any ecosystem I'm familiar with, but we certainly feel that there is a, uh, a real estate component and a sense of place component uh, to this. But as you think about the support system for small scale producers, recognize one, it's not just about the place. It's not just about funding them. I mean, there's a whole host of sort of skill sets, roles, organizations that need to come around the table if you're gonna truly build this up um, as, a, as a larger portion uh, sort of, uh, of your overall market and truly help them to scale. It's gonna take these kinds of things working cooperatively together. Again, that alignment of resources and capacity to make that happen. And finally, like this is just um, a recognition that someone's got to own those things. So who's the lead partner on it? Because most organizations can't handle or aren't set up to be everything, obviously, to everyone. We're pretty niche uh, focused. And then like, what role do you play? Like sometimes you're the connector, sometimes you're the actual developer of the program, or the supporter. So you know, as you look to build out your support system for these small scale producers, like, I think this is an important conversation to have, even if it's like building out a shared um, sort of dashboard of work plan activities. So you better understand who's doing what, what role you're playing, I got your back, you got my back kind of thing. Um, that's truly what I think a lot of this uh, takes. Um, so one example that you might um, start to follow, we're just getting geared up for it. You may have um, heard about it. So the Department of Housing and Community Development here in Virginia um, launched a pilot initiative um, back in like, I think the RFP was around like October-ish of 2019. These five communities or regions in some cases were selected. Primarily, one, they had good proposals, but two, was also some geographic distribution and some different typologies. There's some small towns in here. There's some like Bristol all the way in sort of the Appalachian um, area to Middle Peninsula along the coast to urban environment um, to, in some cases, a little bit suburban kind of stuff. Um, but like it gives you a little bit of different feel. You know, this program's gonna have uh, quite a bit of like TA, market analysis, support system building. So in each case, there's gonna be an ecosystem overlay where partners are coming to the table, taking different parts of that ecosystem, building out the pipelines of these small scale producers and setting up systems uh, for growth. And so this pilot's gonna run, it's just getting kicked off actually in a couple of weeks actually next week in Bristol. <laughs> um, and then we'll run about a year and a half um, in terms of some of the, the TA. There will also be some, some funding partners in, in terms of some of the implementation that will come out um, around the support system design. Um, and that will be forthcoming uh, as well. But I know Susan wanted me to, to mention um, this. But there's also initiatives, or other initiatives around the state. Doug's got a program in, in Fairfax. Um, I know there's a program in Charlottesville. Um, there's probably more that aren't like I, I'm forgetting, but um, there's, there's definitely um, starting to be much more of a, a focus um, around this. And I think building a network of those folks um, can also be extremely important. So I know I've talked your ear off, um, but I'll be glad to answer questions. But certainly, thank you for your time and for coming out this afternoon. Okay.
I think we're like going around with that. Yeah. Do, yeah, she's going with the micro, microphone. Yeah, we'll come make do sure. We, we do you. we know very much about the demographics of the people who are actually doing this? I mean, are they recent immigrants that are bringing products from the old country or have language barriers? Are they early retirees who are starting second careers? <laughs> who are these people? Yeah, yeah, good, great question. Um, certainly, uh, we have more data on just entrepreneurs in general than probably like singling out small scale. Producers is probably a deeper dive that's needed into that. The problem is so much of that data is typically collected by like from a NICS code or some sort of federal. There is none for small scale. Like it's all industry sector. However, my, like just in general, somewhat anecdotally, but if you think about just startups in general, women are definitely the fastest growing segment um, of the market, especially when you look at downtowns in urban commercial corridors. So while overall entrepreneurship is, is being um, um, led in terms of growth rates by uh, women and minority and immigrant populations, it's hyper concentrated when you look at downtowns in urban districts, okay? So um, um, if you take that, you might be able to do a little bit of extrapolation, but I don't think we have definitive on like who these folks typically um, are. Some is frankly um, due to um, the economy as well. People thinking about side hustles that need to generate additional income. The barriers are so low and I've got platforms. Now I can start this, earn a little income on the side and Eureka, maybe I can like scale this and it becomes my full-time gig. It's my passion, I'm, you know? So I think there's some of that uh, as well. Yes. So Baltimore is a place where the need is great and um, you, you talked about economic equitable development, and that's the city, urban area that needs it. Um, one of the things that I didn't mention to you earlier before you started to talk is I want to help create jobs in Baltimore, and I'm looking for an economist who can help me. My business helped me to inspire this idea, actually. I'm looking for economists who can help me do a business case analysis of a business model were companies of the textile manufacturing base. I'm talking about the companies that make the dyes, you know, the fabric, and so on and so forth, come together to share costs, like labor costs, yeah. energy costs, and capital expenses. So your organization, would you be able to connect me with any Yeah, companies? you know, that's probably not a circle we run in. However, I mean, if you think about, especially in that particular industry, I mean, there are certainly, like, Academic programs still like Texas, like go to North Carolina University, some of the heavy um, areas or up in the Northeast where they had historic legacies in textile. And the unfortunate thing, a lot like a lot of that, the like that particular industry like left the country. And so whether or not there are those kinds of things, but if you're looking at like building case studies or models around that that might be an academic pursuit um, at a university that still has maybe some programming in that area as well. Um, I just don't know enough about that particular industry. Other, other questions? Um, you mentioned makerspaces a few times in your presentation. Can you talk about whether makerspaces are like single um, uh, entities? Like, are they mainly bakers all yeah. you know in the same space? Are they clothing manufacturers? Yeah, I, I think. Um, and again, anecdotally, I don't have a study on makerspaces or anything like that. But anecdotally, I think what you tend to see. Like with baking and food, it's such a specialized, it needs, you know, you need commercial kitchen material. Like that tends to be like um, a kitchen incubator or a shared kitchen facility. Now there's like even like brewery incubators that are popping up in some areas associated with like technical colleges with brewing instruction. Um, and then same thing for like in Lansing, there's like the pure fashion. So I think you see like industry specific where perhaps the equipment or something like that is very, I think maker spaces are, are, are more good for like if you're doing um, maybe like printing or some engineering kinds of um, stuff. Um, so like I don't know when you get down to like 
individual, very highly specialized or specific um, industry sectors. Like if you find it there or an association maybe with a, with a program at an academic institution where you can get some of that. I mean, Makerspace? Yeah, I'm sure like, like, like they're like growing like crazy, like library systems and individual groups, private organizations to like are doing these things, yeah. There we go, perfect. Um, and uh, unfortunately, makerspaces don't make money. Is the, <laughs> it's true. The, the yeah. biggest problem is, especially with a space like ours, we, um, uh, and, and I've got cards, um, but our space is primarily a training facility, and we happen to have a lot of really high-end tooling that allows for our training um, that we recognized lays dormant a lot of times, and so when it's lying dormant, we can make some extra money on it. But we also put in a lot of our tooling because we were able to buy all of the assets from Tech Shop, which, w which went uh, super bankrupt yeah. uh, in Crystal City, because makerspaces traditionally aren't able to make enough money to facilitate the space continuing to exist because all of that tooling and all those all the equipment is really, really expensive and really hard to maintain. Uh, and so as a, as a makerspace, as a, as a hub for innovation is a great idea in practice, but it needs something else. It either needs subsidization from industry or the community at large to be able to maintain its existence, or it ends up like Tech Shop. Yeah. I always wonder, not to like get too far off, but I always wonder, like, can you, can you begin to leverage localized assets like other manufacturers to do more like sort of virtual maker spaces? So you still have a system that manages it, but the whole like space and equipment, which is the most expensive part of it, can you leverage existing resources to do it almost, again, like sort of like an Airbnb kind of style, um, especially like in rural economies, which to try to do a maker space would just be the, probably the resources. Yeah, I mean, we're, we're lucky because we have the benefit of some of our members are, think, are organizations like uh, Capital One, okay. uh, cyber funded small businesses, uh, theaters in the area, things like that, who are able to pay a market rate that makes sense for them yeah. and makes sense for the, the work that they need to do, which then allows us to work with local uh, programs and after school programs and things like that at the rate that they can pay. So yeah, it, it becomes cool. this kind of balance that you have to strike between what you have to pay, you have to charge to be able to make the space function versus what you want to charge for people like um, an underserved community member who right. has a good idea to get started. We have to be able to find a way to balance that either with what we can do as a private organization that runs the thing or with partnerships with local industry and, and municipality. So, yeah. Great. Who, who is that? What's the name? Zometry. They Zometry? Have, yeah, they'll do like 3D printing manufacturing network. So they have taken smaller manufacturers and sort of source that out so you can go to them then they'll direct it to the manufacturers so they've collected sort of smaller manufacturers. See, all good ideas are always taken. What the heck? No. <laughs> Where are they based out of, by the way, for anyone that wants to know? Or I think they have locations in other, everywhere. Other... I think there's some in Maryland. Okay. But they don't do the... Right. Zoometry. Is that what you say? All right. I want to look them up. Okay, cool. Thank you for that. Zometry with an X. Oh, okay. Thank you. This gentleman. Um, you described a pipeline that went from someone's basement to a 40,000 square foot manufacturing facility. What if somebody doesn't want to do that? Are there any businesses that you guys have encountered that have successfully gone to Main Street and then instead of scaling in this kind of typical drive down costs and get bigger sort of way, but they got broader? Uh, I oh, think it got into in other Ann industry Arbor. segments or something like that? Sure. That yeah, pro other product their lines. Local community. Yeah. Um, and so some of the things you mentioned, working together with website development companies or, like I work with metal fab guys to solve problems. Yeah. Um, but people who have then branched into other locally relevant businesses as opposed to trying to grow their market and eventually leaving the, 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 same, the communities that you're talking about enriching. Yeah. Um, I, I think that actually is, is more frequent than the actual going to the 40,000 square. I mean, that's a heavy leap, you know? Um, so I think there, there's probably actually more opportunity to, to diversify across lines uh, than to go that leap. I mean, it's great if that um, happens, um, but it's probably more frequent that people 
um, stay sort of in that space. Um, Um, in my feeble brain cells that I'm left at the end of a Friday, like it's not coming to me. Um, <laughs> I think the other, the other issue is like, frankly, we don't have enough of, I call the in. We don't, we don't have enough like case study examples. Um, you know, a lot of this is, is still at the anecdotal phase. It's the visual. You know, and so it's it's the you know you're going in the trenches, you're seeing it, you're talking to people that are doing it, but that's kind of like um, I haven't seen a lot of documentation and data um, around it. I think th that's sort of the lacking part of this particular sort of new emerging sector of manufacturing. But but we have a new research um, <laughs> person coming on board, and so it'd be nice to put them on that. All right. Well, hey, thanks everyone for coming out. If you have follow-up questions, you ever want to chat about this, I'm always interested in learning more. We certainly don't know everything by any means. So if there's my contact information. Feel free to call, email. Um, I'm not fancy and have all that other stuff, so just use that. That's okay. good. I'll be sure to put all that up on our website. I'll make sure that uh, people here get the get that information. And don't leave without a donut or a cookie, please. We can, you can stay here and chat amongst yourselves for a bit. We've got some time. Great. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you for all your uh, input.